Hello guys and welcome to MDTV interview series. My name is Marams Yabi and I'm your host for today. MDTV is a platform to encourage and expose young diverse individuals who are doing amazing things in our society. And to start us off, we have the amazing author, social activist, entrepreneur, businessman, and that is Jeremiah Emmanuel B.E.M. Hello Jeremiah. That was a nice intro. Nice to have you today, you MD, know. MD. How have you been doing, you know, and how has lockdown been treating you before we um, even get into anything? Yeah, no, I've been good. Um, I've just been keeping really, really busy with like work and stuff. Um, obviously adapting to like all of the different changes. Um, it's had its pros and cons. Like, again, business has been good in some places, mm -hmm. it's been bad in others because of the consequences of the lockdown, but yeah. It's been good. I've been good. How are you? I'm good. I feel like lockdown's really ending, to be honest. I saw a tweet that said it made the best immune system win. And that's literally what I'm going with now because I just feel like everyone stay safe, you know, stay alert and just follow the government guidelines. Yeah, so before we even start, I feel like there's so much to talk about with you. Like you actually have a BEM awarded by the Queen, but we'll get into that soon. But um, I want to understand, you know, how was your childhood growing up? Because I feel like every person that's successful on the road to success, they always have a story. Like you'll hear them say, you know, I grew up in a deprived area, you know, I wanted to make my mum proud. So, you know, how was growing up for you? Um, what's a big but, you know, in fact, I actually have your synopsis from your book. And this is what you say. Let me read out your exact words. You say, raised in South London, I lived in an area where crime and poverty were everywhere and opportunities to escape were rare. Violence was accepted, prison was expected. Your best friend might vanish overnight, never to be seen again. That was the world I knew, the only one I thought was possible for people like me. What do you mean by that? Um, you know, I grew up in a crazy environment. Well, I was born in Croydon. Mm -hmm. I moved around a lot. You know, my life hasn't been easy. I know a lot of people have a backstory. Mine was that, you know, I was born to an amazing family, came a single parent home. Okay. Um, my family was like, we were basically homeless, like at the beginning of my life. So between the age of like one to seven, mm -hmm. I moved about seven different times. Oh wow. Because we had to go between temporary accommodation. Mm -hmm. That's something that we call like the hidden homeless. So mm -hmm. you would have heard with Grenfell, you know, it took a long time. Even certain people are still not housed mm -hmm. like correctly. Um, so I had that crazy like experience um, and then sort of when we settled down and we finally got a place, you know, I was at peace and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, growing up a lot of the time, I, I felt like I was on a run because mm. we didn't have a permanent place to reside in. And then, um, yeah, growing up, you know, I grew up in Brixton, um, in Lambeth, mm -hmm. a really sort of like tough area for anyone to grow up in. Um, again, I'm proud that I'm from an area like Brixton because it definitely made me, uh, definitely. It definitely contributed to like all of my success, I would say now. Um, but yeah, it was tough being a young black boy sort of growing up in Britain. It comes with like all of its consequences, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, you know, growing up in Brixton was tough because there were so many online issues that were affecting so many people within our community. And like, what was so out of the norm was so accepted. Like, I noticed that growing up, so many things were desensitized. Definitely. Um, like, I was so desensitized from certain things, you know, whether it's violence, crime, um, the fact that there's tons of unemployment um, where I'm from. We can talk about several different issues that affect young people. But again, like, I was so desensitized from this craziness um, and again, in the title of my book, Dreaming in a Nightmare, um, it basically summarises like me growing up. Again, I had dreams in this nightmare. And the nightmare isn't saying that growing up in Brixton, you're growing up in a nightmare. But it was a realisation that my reality Definitely. could be seen as a nightmare to someone else. Mm -hmm. And I only came to realise this when I sort of got out of the ends. I started mixing certain like circles and mm -hmm. stuff. And these were people that definitely didn't grow up in South London, mm. definitely from different places. And they just couldn't relate to a lot of the things that I had gone through, you know. I remember sitting around the table talking about stock and search mm -hmm. um, with one of my clients. Um, and I was sort of saying, yeah, I've been stocked and search about 10 to 15 times. It's just a crazy amount of times. Um, and, and when I said that, everyone's shocked. Yeah, they're looking me. at you differently, like, yeah, how can but, that happen? But yeah. if, if I was around a table demanding with my friends, like, we'll all be laughing about it, we'll all be annoyed. Like, in my book, I even talk about the fact that uh, me and my friends had a game whenever we'll be driving. Mm -hmm. 
if we see a police van or police car go past, we count down the amount of seconds it will take for them to spin it That's and then crazy. stop us. And like the majority of the times that we've done it, it worked like, and it was so like, we'll just laugh about it all the time. Um, so like, even when I was sharing some of these stories um, to others, they couldn't comprehend that this was something I Your had reality. to go through. Mm-hmm. And again, it isn't that anyone's ignorant or they don't want to know about these issues. It's, it's the fact that it's not informed. People mm-hmm. don't know about what goes on in the hood. But like, honestly, a lot of the situations that I found myself in growing up, you know, um, it never made the news. I've been mm-hmm. enough parties, it ends with gunshots. Mm-hmm. You know, I've seen countless amounts of stabbings. Um, and these are realities that a lot of people in this country I'm not gonna know about. And I feel like what I like about your story, you didn't limit yourself. You didn't allow your reality to like become like you. Do you get what I mean? In the sense of, you know, you obviously we've spoken in the past and you talked about how your mum is a youth worker. So how did that was your mum like an inspiration to you? Did you feel like you wanted to obviously you said you're from a single parent um, household, did you feel like you wanted to know help your mum or show her that you don't wanna end up like a stereotype or statistic? Do you get what I'm yeah, trying to say? Um, well, definitely, my mum is my biggest inspiration. Like, mm-hmm. That lady, she's just amazing. My mum started off as a youth worker yeah. in her spare time, always about giving back to people. Mm-hmm. You know, when I was growing up, she always said that you should help others regardless mm-hmm. of if they're more fortunate or less fortunate, fortunate than yourself. Yeah. And like, that was just a lesson that stayed with me. And because I saw how hard she worked and the amount of lives that she was impacting, mm-hmm. it just inspired me. Uh, well, it definitely inspired you because by the age of 13, you already got the Teen Hero Award and you already had your own cent- social enterprise, the One Big Community. Yeah. And the reason I, I want to say this, because at 13, I'm not going to lie, I definitely was probably outside, probably partying with my friends in the park. But with you, you were so driven at such a young age. And that's what obviously I really like about you. However, not everyone has that drive at, at such a young age. You know, when you're 13, it's more of like, go out with my friends, go mm. to the cinema. But with you, I feel like your mum definitely influenced, with you, uh, influenced your thought. But you were doing so much at such a young age. Do you feel like obviously that's because of your experiences or just who you like were as a person? I think that was about facing disappointment. I saw mm. so much like disappointment, um, disappointment in my life. Mm-hmm. Whether it was the fact that you know my parents split up and then my, my dad happened to pass away, mm-hmm. I didn't really get to like grow up with him and have the opportunity to be with him. Whether it was the fact that even by thirteen, you know about four people that had lost their lives to youth violence. There's loads of different things happening amongst us as friends. So even when I was in that position, I just said, "Yeah, disappointment, no more." Mm-hmm. And like as I was growing up again. It was amazing that like, shadowing my mum, I started shadowing her like around the age of four or five, like, I was a baby. But like, I, I just started picking up things and then I started getting interested in politics. And yeah, like I was just all for the community. But mm-hmm. again, for me, I would say the reason I started so young, I, I was just informed from a very young age. Yes, like, um, yeah. Because my mum, whether that was the fact that every, every single day I would watch the news, every single day, sometimes I wouldn't even understand what they were talking about. But like just the fact that I in in my mind I was just so up to date with society, mm-hmm. I think that definitely helped me. Um, and again, I I did have people that I could actually look up to. Mm-hmm. So my first ever mentor was my next door neighbour, and his name Mr Briggs. Um, you called him. Big so, up, Mister. <laughs> so um, literally, Mr Briggs. Like when he he saw that I had an interest in politics. He helped me in like my election campaign mm-hmm. when, when I got into youth politics. So like, I was elected into like the UK Youth Parliament. I was younger, Lambeth. Oh yeah, you were. <laughs> um, and that was all from that guy. And then I had like different people around me that naturally, sometimes you know they wouldn't come to me. I was just mm-hmm. so interested in people. Like I, I was never nervous to like approach mm-hmm. someone or network. Mm-hmm. And that was something that really helped me from a young age. I think my school. Um, I went to Archbishop Tennyson School in Oval Kennington, mm-hmm. um, and like that school, like they really a- allowed me to like do a lot of extracurricular activities. Mm-hmm. Like they really allowed me to get involved in all of that. So yeah, it just happened to ha- um, so it happened at a very young age. I feel like you're a great example of not allowing your circumstances to like govern you, because I feel like you know people that are from like probably deprived areas, they say to themselves, you know what, I'm from here, we don't really get far, I'm not gonna try, just, just so they like they don't work on themselves. But you didn't allow that. You didn't like follow that path. And I feel like that's really, really important. And your efforts defi- definitely didn't go to vain because you got the BEM award. 
Yeah. Um, that's an award you don't really see a lot of young black people. You got that at 17. Yeah, I'm the youngest. I'm the youngest black person in the history of the honours list to ever get honoured by the Queen. Okay, for the people that don't know, you know, what to be Emma Wolf is, please let them know where you stand, because you're not a small boy, so please. <laughs> Just let them know, Seth. <laughs> um, so, like, twice a year, there's something that goes on called the New Year's honours list. Mm -hmm. So you've got the New Year's honours mm -hmm. and the birthday honours um, that it falls on the Queen's birthday. Um, so you've got a series of different awards and honours. Um, and again, it could be anything from bravery to your contribution to society. Mm -hmm. um, so the way it happened, I was in studio with Tiny Temple. Literally, mm -hmm. I got a call Tiny my who? Mom. Tiny Temple. Okay. <laughs> okay, I got a call Even my move closer, yeah? And then um, she was like, oh, Jeremiah, what have you done? There's a letter here from the government. But obviously, it kind of looked like a, a, something to do Was it a brown letter? Because you know when you get them brown yeah, letters, you know what it is. Mm. Oh, boy, my mom thought something to do with tax or whatever. So, um, because I recently opened a company, um, so I, I ran home, literally, because she sounded really concerned. Did she open it, or did you guys open it together? For me. Yeah. And we opened it together, and then it was a letter from the head of the civil service, so the wow. government, saying that Theresa May would like to forward my name to the Queen to be honoured in the honours list. Um, wow. And it would mean that I would become, the official name is, well, me, it's a medalist of the order of the British Empire, but mm -hmm. that's like the, the long name. But obviously this letter was like a yes or no, do you want to accept it? Of course. And like, in terms of me, like, because the honours list sometimes, because it has a lot of negative connotations from a few people. Yeah, definitely. The history. history and uh, relation to the British Empire and stuff. But for me, it was like, can I name one person from where I'm from? Yeah, had an opportunity like this to inspire. Young, you were seventeen, young yeah, black, 17, South like, London. I was in, I was in first, was, I was in second year of college, so like I was young, and for me, I just used it as an opportunity. I said to myself that I will, from this time forward, I'm gonna inspire mm -hmm. as many people as possible. Mm -hmm to just go for their dreams and like, achieve their targets and goals. And that's what I want to speak about, because obviously a lot of young black boys, not everyone takes, everyone takes different routes in life. We have boys that are footballers, rappers, but the route you've taken in life is very different. And so I feel like it's important for people to understand you don't have to take the conventional routes. Like, yeah, follow your passion. If you want to change, influence um, people, you can do it and you'll definitely get recognised. Like, what you've done at 17 is actually amazing. But a lot of people sometimes, you know, they feel like, Obviously, you're from South London, and I'm sure you have friends that don't really have the same pathway as you, but because of what they've seen you do, they probably respect you more, because they probably think of, rah, like, my boys in Parliament, you know, they'll speak like that, and they're very, like, you know, confident to say that about you, but in the sense that some people might feel, if I, you know, work in Parliament, or if I want to be an activist, people might look at me differently, mm -hmm. like a neat when it's really not that. Yeah. If you yeah. follow your passion, follow what you want to do, people, you know, they'll come to yeah, you, like, I'm sure. I'll be real, like, for what I was doing, I should have been labelled the top geek, like that that is what yeah. I should be labeled as but for some reason everyone respected what i was doing like everyone like even in my area on ends like everyone respected what i was doing so i i used to get asked from time to time oh don't people say like oh like it's a bit nerdy what you're doing or whatever but all the money respected what i've done and because you respected what you do and you had confidence in what you're doing i feel like yeah, when you definitely. you're determined about something and you're passionate no one can tell you anything different yeah a million percent and going back to your earlier point i feel again in the environment that you know we sort of grew, um, grew up in you know again we're very limited because there's only a certain level of success that we see and that's about football music mm -hmm. even bad success that is still seen it's glamorized yeah that is glamorized so at the end of the day for me it's just making people understand that you don't have to be fixed or or you don't even think you don't have to think that the dream is only going to come from specific things yeah you don't only have to think that the dream's going to come from music or the dream's going to come from football and again like there's not enough representation perfect across, that's mm -hmm. like, various different industries so again for a young person who wants to become a lawyer wants to become a doctor and stuff like at senior levels and stuff we, we don't have enough diversity and representation. So mm -hmm. it's very, very hard, but that's definitely something that I'm it's trying very, to change. It's very important. And I feel like in the 
you know, the climate went in with the whole like Black Lives Matter movement, Black Lives Always Matter. I feel like it's really important that young black people start to dominate these industries. Of, obviously with what you're doing, even like in hospitals, you know, in government, because at the end of the day, we're still, you know, a group of people that need to be represented. And with what you're doing, you're making it clear to people that, you know, you can do this, you can be accepted, you can be recognized despite your skin, your skin color, where you're from. I feel like that's really, you know, important. So yeah. yeah. Um, I feel like what people actually really want to know and what I want to really speak on is how did you get the co-signs from the likes of Richard Branson and Bill Gates? Like, you are chilling with Richard Branson. I'm not going to lie. You don't really see that. Like, Richard Branson, if they don't know... If you don't know who Richard Branson is, he's a founder of Virgin. You can even add... You probably know more than me. But how did you get to work with those people? Because I feel like with you, you've actually defied the odds, like, in the sense of... You're from South London, as we know. You're black relatively young and you're working with people that <laughs> you see them on like Forbes, you see them on Google, you don't really feel like you would ever meet them. How did you get into those environments? Um, well, it's all a journey. Mm. Like, not everything sort of happened at once. And for me, like, I can't say that I plan for any, any, anything to happen. Like, I thank God mm -hmm. every day that I've been put in a position to network with people mm -hmm. and be connected to really incredible people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like sort of, in, in terms of um, Richard Branson, I'm, I'm an ambassador for a charity called Big Change. Um, ambassador? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. It's an educational charity. Yeah. And we're, we're sort of reimagining education for the work that we do. Um, and Big Change was founded by Holly and Sam Branson, Princess Beatrice, and a few of their friends. And it's because they noticed that there was a massive problem mm -hmm. in the education sector. Mm -hmm. um, Hence why, you know, I sort of got involved in that and I was given the opportunity to. Um, I was 15 years old at an event called um, We Day. It, it, it was at Wembley Arena, an incredible organisation that promotes social activism across the UK mm -hmm. amongst like, young students. So I had the opportunity to interview Holly. Um, and after I interviewed Holly, I sort of gave an elevator pitch and told her about some of the work I was doing. Wow. And one of my earlier mentors was already sort of connected with the organization. Um, so that's how I got involved. And I sort of met Richard for the first time on, on a number of different occasions, but through um, the Virgin Strive Challenge, mm -hmm. which is um, an adventurous challenge, crazy, it pushes you to your limit, um, cycling for like, oh, yeah, it, it's just crazy cycling, hiking. Yeah, I've seen on Instagram, yeah. Um, but we go through the pain to obviously raise money for this incredible charity. And like, even when I was involved in it, I couldn't complete every single one I got involved mm -hmm. with. But again, like it was um, just incredible to be a part of it. Because you basically live two realities. You've seen like the dark end, obviously where you used to live, and you've worked with people that you're basically trying to get to. So I feel like yeah. you've obviously seen that. Yeah, I've, I've had crazy juxtapositions like, um, you know, there was um, a moment where I, we were on a Strive Challenge and I asked Richard Branson to FaceTime my mom. I saw that, that. yeah, I saw that. So like, even around that time when it happened, i have gone back to my hotel room and um, a couple of days sort of before that, I was reflecting in my room, but a couple of days before that, one of my childhood friends was getting buried. He lost mm -hmm. his life due to mm -hmm. youth violence and again, I was, in this place, obviously raising money for charity, so I couldn't be there. Um, but yeah, sort of that juxtaposition, or even down to the fact that one of my friends was in intensive care, um, inside intensive care after mm. being um, stabbed. And literally, as it happened, and I'd been there, I noticed that um, the Virgin office was around the corner. So I called um, Essie, who's the CEO of Big Change, mm -hmm. um, and I asked her to come in for a meeting because she wanted to talk about my involvement a bit more. So I literally called Essie, walked from the hospital about 10 minutes to the Virgin office. And again, everyone in the office probably didn't know I just came from the hospital and that my friend was stabbed the night before. But you just but had again, to, like, that's just something I had to do. And mm -hmm. even that interview and sit down that we had changed my life because I was given the, the opportunity either to go to uni, I was given a, a full scholarship to go to uni. Oh, wow. So it was able to accept the full scholarship and go to study something that I wasn't necessarily interested in, but mm. I knew that I wouldn't be in debt after uni or to move forward with big change as an ambassador and to become a youth consultant for a year. 
So I decided at that moment to go with the change. Yeah, and definitely. That was one of like the, the best decisions I've ever made in my life. Like it truly like changed my life. And um, again, like I just had these, even another one in my book, the first couple of pages you'll read it. Um, oh yeah, by the way, Emily contributed to the book, by the way. I did, so, so make sure you guys, in fact, we'll get to the book because that's, <laughs> yeah, that's my yeah. next topic I need to speak to you about. So yeah. not only are you, you know, a social activist, businessman, entrepreneur, you're actually an author now. And I feel like you being an author, do you feel like it's something you stumbled into? I or do you definitely, think, there's no way on this earth I wouldn't, when I was 16, 17, I would have said a woman. Because I feel like everyone, you know, when you're young, you say, you know, I can't wait to write my own book about my life, but we all say it, but yeah. you're actually actually done it so yeah no honestly like I, I never expected it like at all so i was thinking about that me when i said it you know that me i never expected it so but i never expected that at all i stumbled into it yeah um and it was the hardest thing i've ever done in my life oh um, 12 months it was very hard it was like, very I hard to, i had to call an md for reinforcements boy like, it was very hard but me. writing a book at what 20 when did you start writing it when you're 20 probably 20. Yeah, i started writing it at 20. yeah i think and i wrote it in life well well it started 12 months prior yeah to, to when it was finished but the amount of times that i had to change it around and stuff I think that really and truly, I technically only wrote it for about six months. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I like about your book, the title? Like, Dreaming in a Nightmare. When you listen, like, when you hear that title, I feel like you need to listen to it again because that's your life story. Because I feel like what we've been discussing, I can see that the things you've been through have really impacted how you see life and impacted the extent of change you want to create in this world. And what does Dreaming in a Nightmare mean to you for anyone that obviously probably doesn't know why you use such a term? So um, at the beginning of my book, in the introduction, the very start, I said, all my life I've had dreams and a nightmare because where I'm from, there's no scenery and no sun. I've just tried hard to work for my mom. I'm just a young entrepreneur who's trying to change the world. And I captured that on the 23rd of October, 2017. And then um, it was sort of after that, when it came to com um, coming up with the concept for my title, I sort of just looked at the caption, chopped it up, and then wow. it became dreaming in a nightmare. And yeah, like, again, it, it reflected my life, but the life of many people. And again, everyone has their own nightmare, mm -hmm. my, in my own opinion, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I, I, I had a meeting with a really wealthy couple, and they were talking to me about the fact they were um, having a meeting with a friend. And the friend was speaking to them about his family and the fact that there was problems with his wife and with his kids. And um, he, he sort of went on to say, like, you guys have everything. You've got, like, dozens of properties. You've got all yeah. of these cars. You, you're millionaires. Um, like, I'm going through all of this stress. And they turned around to him and said, cool, like, we have everything in the world that we could need. But in our years of marriage, we've been trying for kids and we haven't we yet haven't, to yeah. have kids. So everyone really does have their own thing they yeah, go through. Yeah, the flip side so. was like um, the other way around for us. It's because like, even though we've grown up in a crazy environment, you know, we still have a roof over our heads. Yeah, we still have shelter, clean water, we still have clean water. education. So to anyone else, our reality mm -hmm. can be seen as a nightmare, but mm -hmm. also to anyone else, our reality can be seen as a dream. So for obviously your book's coming out soon. Everyone make sure you pre-order the book and it will make sure you buy the book when it comes out. Um, what's the one thing you want people to take from this book when they read it? Just the one thing you really want people to understand when they read this book? That your environment does not define you. Oh, definitely, yep. Yeah. And I think that sums it up, like, again, to me, I thought, like, I, I've had crazy thoughts in the past where I've actually thought, like, am I going to make it past a certain age? Mm -hmm. And like, I'll be in crazy situations and it will just be like, oh, like, it's, it's a madness, mm -hmm. but to anyone, like, your environment does not define you. If you're you're from a broken home, you're from a crazy environment, you know, that's not the end. That's okay, Jeremiah, so obviously to finish it off, like, this has been a great discussion. Like, you've taught mm -hmm. me so much, and this has just been a great discussion. <laughs> um, where do you see yourself in the next five years? What can we expect from you? Well, um, I'm currently building up a number of different companies. So I run um, a multi-purpose entertainment company called Just Entertainment. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I run a consultancy agency called EMNL. It stands for Empowering and Motivating the Next Generation of Leaders. Oh, wow. And um, it's just the fact that when I was growing up, I noticed that um, young people 
had so many brilliant ideas and we worked with so many brands, but did the brands communicate with us? They didn't. Mm -hmm. And I just never understood how, as a company, you don't communicate with your consumer, but you try and figure out what it is that they want, if that makes sense. So I created this company to go into big brands, to go into big organizations, to mm -hmm. basically coach them on youth, to tell them this is what the youth of today are thinking, to set up youth councils and focus groups. Um, my first ever client was Rolls Royce. Um, that happened after emailing 40 CEOs and having not one response back. Mm -hmm. But one of my friends said to me, you know, you're fed up, you want to give up. If you want to give up, give up, but it's going to be 100% no. But if you continue sending emails... Someone's going to open that door for you. open the door. And the next email I sent, I sent it on my 16th birthday. No, my 15th birthday. <laughs> you started from young, boy. <laughs> no, no, my 16th birthday. So the day before my 16th, I sent the email. And then Paul Broadhead, the CEO of Rolls Royce, got back to me saying, we we'll love you to influence Rolls Royce, right. in the company. Mm -hmm. um, and this was like a company you would have thought was impossible compared to even some of the smaller ones. You know, ones sometimes I send emails and I'm thinking, I know they're not going to reply, but God said try. No, but... That's yeah, what I do. I don't even kill myself. Go through it. And again, like that business, so mm -hmm. far in the three years of trading, I would say about 70 or 60% of our business came from those initial emails. So mm -hmm. if I never continue pushing, 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 whether it's from Nike mm -hmm. to Nando's to Superdry, whoever it was, like, if I didn't send the emails, it would have never happened. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, those two things are happening. And then with the book, um, I would say that's a five year project. Again, a book is for a lifetime. I don't know when I want to write the next one. Mm. It will be a very long time. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking to create the Dreaming in the Nightmare Fund. Um, oh, wow. So we're raising money to create our own community fund. And we're going to identify a number of different charities and organizations that are impacting young people um, and, and sort of you know, solving the underlying issues that I talk about in the book. Yeah. Um, well, if you guys want to understand more about that, then you should pre-order the book. Yeah, and, uh, literally, but, dreaminginthenightmare.com. And order it. But honestly, Jeremiah, it's been lovely speaking to you. I have learned so much. You've been a great first guest. This one's going to really go down the history of the book. So everyone, make sure you follow his Instagram and make sure you um, pre-order the book and make sure you watch out for our next episode. Thank you so much. Thank you.